Welcome to the Great Books Podcast. Today we'll talk about Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. I'm your host, John J. Miller of National Review, and you're listening to a production of National Review. This episode is sponsored by Audible, and I'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. Our guest is Lorraine Murphy, a professor of English at Hillsdale College in Michigan. She is a frequent guest on this show, and we last recorded with her earlier this year about The Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. She joins us in the studio of Hillsdale College's campus radio station, WRFH. Lorraine, welcome back to the Great Books Podcast. I'm so pleased to be back, John. Why is Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen a great book? Well, first, I think it's worth saying that it was her first published novel in 1811. And what's remarkable is that it is already so mature and complete and uh, craftsmanlike. It has a, a subtle humor. It has a complicated plot uh, involving two heroines, which is uh, notable. It has a great deal of very sophisticated social criticism. It has an emphasis on the theme of judging character, which is just sort of quintessentially Jane Austen, and it's written in that beautiful, economical, um, precise prose that is one of her great, uh, great strengths as a novelist. So it's just many wonderful things. We're going to try and get to all of that. The heroines, of course, the plot, the social criticism, the prose, the humor. We'll see what we get to. I want to start with the very first words of this novel. Of course, Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice, a subsequent novel, wrote one of the most famous opening lines in English literature. Yes. Here's, here's how Sense and Sensibility starts. Quote, the family of Dashwood had been long settled in Sussex. Unquote. <laughs> That's not as good, is it? It's not nearly as good. It's not nearly as sparkling. Um, and if you look at Jane Austen's opening lines, it is by far the most sedate and the least enticing. In some ways, I think this is a sedate book. It's a slowly developing and unfolding book. And if Pride and Prejudice is your notion of, uh, with, with its great, you know, sort of witty dialogue, uh, if that's your notion of what makes Jane Austen great, then Sense and Sensibility will take some getting used to. Now, we do learn from this opening line that the book is going to be about the family of Dashwood, right? Yes. That's, that, that is one thing that that opening line accomplishes. So who are the Dashwoods? And, and one interesting thing is that though they've been long settled in Sussex, uh, that's about to change. So the drama does come in. The, the Dashwoods are, uh, at, at the opening of the novel, they're a family of women. Uh, they've just lost, uh, Mrs. Dashwood has just lost her husband, and her three daughters have lost their father. And he has had a son by a previous marriage who stands to inherit this long-standing family estate. So on his deathbed, Henry Dashwood asks his son John to be sure he's, he's a legal inheritor from his grandfather of this estate and all of this property. He says, please be sure to take care of um, my wife and your sisters. And he makes that promise. And then he proceeds to effectively break it. So this is, this is a standard Jane Austen plot, isn't it? A kind of complicated inheritance with some, with some women who are going to lose out potentially. It revolves around the inheritance of property. And right away, we get very specific about uh, money and income and what kind of life that enables. So it's another Jane Austen plot with inheritance at the center of it and some women who, who are not going to benefit from the way these, these laws and rules and traditions work yes. in England at this time. They stand to lose their home, Norland, which is in, in Sussex, which is the southeast of England. But tell us about Norland. What is this home? It is a large estate, a great deal of land, and Henry Dashwood – the Dashwood girl's father was the the steward of this this property. In effect, it was his while he lived, but it was left him in such a way that he was obliged to leave it to his son John and was not able to cut it up or sell off any piece of it for the benefit of his wife and daughters. So he extracts a promise from his son John Dashwood: "Would you please take care of them since you are inheriting all of this property?" And they have not much else to live on. John Dashwood agrees to that. And then his wife, Fanny, in a marvelous chapter, gradually talks him around to the notion that all he really needs to do is to be kind and send them a basket of fruit once or twice a year. So she's she's kind of a schemer, isn't she, Fanny Dashwood? Yes. It's a little bit of a Lady Macbeth scene in a very, very minor and comical key. Now, the Dashwood sisters... These, these three sisters are, are the women who stand to lose out. 
in in the transfer of of Norland. They're going to get kicked out of this home. Yes, they are Eleanor, Marianne, and Margaret. Uh, who are they? Let's start with Eleanor. She's the main character in certain ways of the book. Yes, yes. She is 19, and she is a young woman of remarkable sense in terms of the title. She is discerning. She is generally a very good judge of character. She is um, somewhat reserved and certainly very self-controlled, but she has a uh, also a, a large heart and a deep fund of feelings, but she tends to keep this back. It's not the first thing that you would notice about her. Her sister Marianne is 17. She's younger and she's much more romantic. She is the young woman of sensibility in terms of the title. And what that means is that she is very both sort of physically and emotionally sensitive um, and given to sort of extremes of feeling. And in this, she resembles her mother. So the mother and Marianne are very sympathetic with one another. They sometimes fail to understand Eleanor with her greater degree of composure and restraint. And then Margaret, the youngest girl, is about 13, and we don't really learn much about her. She's a, she's a minor character. It's yes. Eleanor and, and Marianne who are, who are the two main figures in this book. Let's talk about the title then and how it relates to these characters. You've already mentioned Eleanor is is connected to the idea of sense. Marianne, of course, is connected to the idea of sensibility. What does that mean, sense and sensibility? I, I think the um, etymological link between the two words is important. Um, and yet, those words have developed in the English language in different directions, and Jane Austen is playing with that um, comparison and contrast, certainly with these characters. So sense here means largely what we would call rational judgment, self-control, um, discernment, good judgment of character, sort of in some sense cerebral qualities, whereas sensibility has to do with the uh, the um, fineness of one's perceptions and the sensitivity, if you like, the vulnerability of one's heart so that a person of sensibility feels and, and, and perceives keenly and responds uh, very emotionally and, and uh, to, to a great degree of extremes. A person of sensibility, in other words, exercises, is able to exercise less restraint than a person of solid good sense. That seems to be uh, one of the main ways in which Jane Austen contrasts these two qualities is in terms of the degree of restraint that they that they invite. And these two characters, Eleanor and Marianne, they embody sense and sensibility. Yes. And we see how they clash or conflict uh, in the story, right? Yes. And one of the first ways we see that, very early in the story, uh, both young women, both sisters, fall in love with a handsome, presumably um, uh, man of good character, a gentleman, someone who uh, they meet, and, and, and the way in which they handle that experience of feeling that they are being courted, uh, having their their affections engaged uh, is really telling of the difference. So Eleanor is very careful not to betray too much emotion until she knows that she's going to be engaged and be married, whereas Marianne is immediately very open about her sentiments for her suitor. And Marianne is seen as in the midst of, of maybe making a mistake, right, yes. where her, her, her emotions lead her in a bad direction, whereas Eleanor's the opposite. She's making a kind of rational decision about yes. a husband. Yes, yes. She's very careful to think in terms of what does she actually know, what are the facts, uh, what is incontestable, whereas Marianne proceeds on trust. And Eleanor keeps asking or wanting to ask her, are you officially engaged? Has this courtship proceeded according to the conventions and mores of the time? And she actually, part of her restraint is that she holds back from asking the question. She feels it would be an intrusion. Well, it turns out that Marianne is not engaged. She has sort of thrown off that sense of um, needing to jump through the hoops, follow all the rules, and it's it's very much to her hurt in the end. Is, is Marianne, she, she rejects convention in a sense, right? And yes. That, and that winds up hurting her? Yes, it does. And this is one of the most interesting questions of the novel is what attitude or um, perspective – uh, on social convention is Austin promoting. She's certainly showing us in Eleanor and Marianne two very different, um, though not entirely dissimilar, attitudes toward the manners and conventions of the time. So Eleanor is always very careful to 
conform to these. And so she goes visiting when she doesn't want to go visiting. And she says the polite thing when she doesn't necessarily mean it with her whole heart. And she spends a great deal of time with people whose society she doesn't necessarily enjoy. And when she is herself, in effect, heartbroken, she keeps that back so as not to burden anyone. You know, she follows the sort of um, standards that are set out for her in terms of social relationships to the letter. And Marianne feels that there's a great deal of hypocrisy and uh, and falsity in, in in following these conventions when one when one's heart is not engaged. And so she proceeds accordingly. She follows her feelings, and she is sometimes rude to people who've been kind to her. And she is certainly imprudent in terms of trusting a man who's not uh, engaged her officially to 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 be married. And uh, and, and and that ends up redounding. Um, very painfully upon her, and, and she, she pays a high price for that. Yet it's not clear whether she suffers because she's been innocent and she's been wronged by someone more cynical, or whether, in a sense, she suffers because she has been so imprudent in defying these conventions. And that's, that's one of the great big interpretive questions that makes this novel so interesting. You're listening to The Great Books Podcast, a production of National Review, and this episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio news, shows, comedies, and a lot more. I love Audible. I listen to it all the time when I'm driving. And on Audible, you can get a Sense and Sensibility exclusive narrated by Rosamund Pike, the English actress who actually played one of the Bennett sisters in a, in a Pride and Prejudice movie with Kira Knightley a number of years ago. Uh, it's, 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 it's a great uh, rendition of Sense of Sense and Sensibility, I recommend it. And if for some reason you don't like Rosamund Pike, there are a bunch of other audiobook versions of Sense and Sensibility available on Audible. You can spend your whole summer listening to them, uh, which would not be a bad way to spend your summer. At any rate, you can start listening to Audible right now with a 30-day trial. Your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash greatbooks or text greatbooks to 500-500. That's audible.com slash greatbooks as one word or text Great books, again, as one word, to 500-500. Lorraine, let's, let's, let's return to our conversation about Sense and Sensibility by, by taking a little bit closer look at Eleanor. She's often seen as the, you know, she's the older sister, of course, maybe the more mature sister. She's more responsible yes. than Marianne, who's, yes. who's, who's swept away by this, uh, by this dashing character who we learn eventually uh, is, is untrustworthy. But is she too sensible? Is she too proper? Uh, to some characters, she, she comes off as cool and and indifferent. And, and you've you've mentioned words like rational judgment and yeah. conformist, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, is 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 there too much sense in this character? She is certainly uh, so sensible as to be misread, as you say, by many characters, including and this is. Uh, somewhat surprising, and, and one of the features of the novel that I sometimes wrestle with a little bit, I confess, but um, including her, her mother and her sister, who know and love her best, uh, they often seem to read her in this very sort of, um, as a kind of caricature of sense, and, and are really sometimes rather unjust, and, and it seems to me cold to Eleanor, and, and this is one of the, as I say, the features of the novel that you feel that the older Jane Austen is going to sort of polish some of these rough spots maybe and, and nuance some of these uh, stark contrasts a little more uh, completely. But um, I think that what prevents us from seeing Eleanor as sort of a cardboard um, version of sense is that so much of the novel is narrated from her point of view so that we see that she is making sensible judgments with with effort and sometimes at at, at a cost and that she is kind of repressing how she really feels um, consciously. And, and I think that prevents her from becoming too wooden and, and too unbelievable a character. This book has a lot of doubles. We start yes. with the title, Sense and Sensibility. Jane Austen loved her her, her literary titles, didn't she? Pride and Prejudice, Sense yes. and Sensibility. Uh, so we, ha we have it right there in the title. We also have two heroines, two suitors, two, two Farrar brothers. We haven't discussed them specifically yet. Uh, two Steele sisters. Yes. A lot of doubles in this book. What's going on here? Oh, it's marvelous. 
Um, I think what's going on in terms of the big picture is that Austin is asking us to think really carefully about how we make judgments of character. And so she's showing that on the one hand, it's quite easy to class people into types. There's the sensible sister and the more emotional sensibility, sister of sensibility. And there's the dashing suitor. That's John Willoughby, who courts Marianne. And there's Edward Ferrers, who's this very shy, reserved, quiet, almost tongue-tied young man. And so they they seem very different. And as you have sisters and brothers everywhere, and they're often these what seem like really stark contrasts between them. And then you look a little closer and you start to see similarities. And you start to think these characters aren't necessarily as different as one might think, including Eleanor and Marianne, I would, I would say. So uh, as you read, you, you, Austin is almost teaching us how to make uh, how to make more careful judgments and discriminations. And it's sort of like the lesson that she famously teaches Elizabeth Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. First impressions aren't necessarily the right ones. You mentioned the dashing John Willoughby, the, mm-hmm. the suitor to Marianne. Who is he and what do we learn about him? Well, he's a young man um, of no profession, really. He has a wealthy relation who is probably a Mrs. Smith who is uh, probably going to leave him most of her property and he sort of awaits that event. Um, Perhaps if he marries with her approval, she will leave some of the property before she dies. And again, this plays on the theme of inheritance and uh, characters' attitudes toward money and property and what they will do to uh, try to gain it. Um, He comes into the country to visit Mrs. Smith, uh, Devonshire, I should say, uh, where the Dashwoods have moved. This is in the southwest of England. And he uh, he meets Marianne by accident, and he's sort of taken with her immediately. And she's a very open um, and affectionate nature. And so he becomes... uh, with no, as we learn later, no, no serious intention, he becomes caught up in spending time with her and with her sisters and mother and, and just very much enjoys their company. So he behaves to her in a way that causes everyone who knows the Dashwoods to assume that he's engaged to Marianne. And then he abruptly leaves. And he has some secrets yes. that we're going to learn about a little bit later in, in, in the story. The other suitor, the other major suitor uh, in this part of the book is as Edward Farrar's, who courts... Eleanor, he has some secrets of his own. That's right. That's exactly right. They both have secrets. They seem like so different. John Willoughby, so sort of um, expressive and open, and uh, Edward, so shy. But in fact, they both court Eleanor and Marianne with with secrets, and and they both, um, in effect, leave these young women without an engagement and without an explanation. Edward is uh, actually the brother of Fanny Dashwood, the uh, wife of John Dashwood, who talks him out of doing anything to help his stepmother and sisters. Um, And so here again, we have a sort of contrast. Fanny Dashwood, who is rather scheming and selfish, and then her brother Edward, who is, uh, it turns out, a man of of great integrity, um, a man who, who keeps his word. But toward Eleanor, he is not entirely fair. For From the beginning, when he first becomes attracted to her, he has been engaged. He's been secretly engaged for four years to a Miss Lucy Steele. And so he elicits Eleanor's affections without having any right to do so. And then he just, when they move away, he effectively uh, breaks off the relationship. In a Jane Austen novel, of course, marriage is in many ways at the center of the plot. What is marriage about in 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 this novel what is the purpose of it it seems to be about promise keeping and that is something that uh it's it's a um a very important and very central theme um now we don't see and this is true of many of austin's works we don't see portrayed in the pages of the novel a great many terribly admirable marriages Um, But we do see solid and established marriages, and we see a great deal of concern with the uh, process by which a young man engages a young woman's affections and whether he is true to his courtship or or not. Um, So John Willoughby, for example, who uh, treats Marianne in such a way that everyone believes they're engaged, including Marianne, in effect, believes they're engaged in in everything but, but the word. Uh, 
he tr- he goes off and and actually engages himself to a young woman who has fifty thousand pounds to inherit. That is that is really what he is after. So he has broken a promise uh, in spirit, if not in letter, and that's that's something that we see all over the text. And so. Um, in terms of the marriages as they're portrayed, uh, you see sometimes the husband and wife are not terribly ill-suited, but they they have children, they have servants, they have extended family and friends, and their household is is a place of um, security, and it's part, one of the mainstays of society. Austin is very clear about that. Security is an important element here, isn't it? Right. Yes. So, so, so marriage is is about love, but but love isn't enough, is it? Oh no. Uh, Income is important, and uh, fidelity is important, and I think you could say that the quality of one's social relationships in a community is highly important, and uh, you need a strong, a strong marriage. And it doesn't have to be emotionally strong, although that is an ideal that Austin always holds up. But um, as long as that assumption that a married couple is to, is to be faithful to one another and that promise is to be kept is there, then, then you see a whole sort of almost, you, you could say, ecosystem growing up around a marriage. You are listening to The Great Books Podcast, a production of National Review. And I want to tell you about National Review Plus. With NR Plus, you get unlimited access to National Review's digital magazine. That means no paywall, all the issues in the 10-year archive, and all the podcasts. But this is more than a digital subscription. It's a membership that includes access to our members-only Facebook page, members-only conference calls with NR writers, editors, and guests, members-only commenting on the site, and a lot fewer ads, including none within articles. To learn more, go to nationalreview.com slash NRPL. U.S. Lorraine, I don't want to have any spoilers here, but maybe there's a little bit of a spoiler, which is which is that Eleanor winds up with Edward Farrars, and Marianne does not wind up with with John Willoughby. That's she, right. she she has another she has another match. But I want, I want to ask about about John Willoughby, this this mm-hmm. dashing suitor who who doesn't quite make the cut for for Marianne. Um, he does seem ripe for reform. In a sense, right, and maybe ultimately a marriage to Marianne, uh, you know, a kind of a kind of redemption possibly for yes. him. But that's not the ending that they have. No, and Austin seems determined to show that that could have been an alternative because long after, in fact, after Willoughby himself is married, when Marianne is very sick, he comes to the house and speaks with Eleanor, and it's a fascinating chapter where uh, he. Opens his heart. He tries to defend his character, and Eleanor finds herself um, almost strangely, oddly drawn in by his charisma to sympathize with him. And he's he's you know notoriously abused her sister, uh, but such is the power of his explanation and and his person that that she, Eleanor herself feels attracted to him. I think it's safe to say in a in a in a very limited way, um, but. You sense there, in, in, if Eleanor herself is willing to sympathize with, you know, all the potential that has been that has been wasted in John Willoughby, we're meant to feel the same. There's an interesting parallel with Henry Crawford, another sort of dashing ne'er do well, if you like, in Mansfield Park. In there too, I think readers are often, even more so, I would argue, than with John Willoughby, drawn to hope for his reform. In fact. Jane Austen's sister Cassandra begged her to let Henry Crawford reform, and uh, and that was not the ending that Austen chose to pursue. But John Welby is certainly an interesting and not a two dimensional character. Are the Dashwood marriages at the end of the novel unambiguously happy? We have we have Eleanor matched to to Edward Ferrars, and then Marianne not to. John Willoughby, but to Colonel Brandon, yes. who, who she meets ver- very early in the novel and, yes. and, and, and objects to a marriage with him, in fact, uh, yes. because he's too old. Yeah. You know, well, the guy's not any younger at the end of the at the end of the novel. At any rate, are, are these are these unambiguously happy marriages at, at, at the end of the book? No. Uh, and in fact, um, and that's one of the things that that in, in some ways I love about this novel. At the end of Northanger Abbey, we're told that the hero and heroine go on to perfect happiness. And that is quite distinctly not what we're told at the end of Sense and Sensibility. Um, We're told that Marianne marries Colonel Brandon with uh, simply uh, her her emotions toward him are a strong esteem and a lively friendship. We're told that she grows to love him with her whole heart after 
she's been married to him for some time, but that's certainly not the sort of being swept off your feet, uh, fairy tale ending that, that some readers might expect. Uh, Eleanor and Edward are uh, quite sincerely um, attached to one another, but their income is small. Uh, and there's, there's a very, there's a sort of odd paragraph that has always struck me uh, where we're told that Edward, who of course has in some ways not entirely done right by Eleanor, when he, when he is freed from his engagement to Lucy Steele, he comes to her and we're told that um, he talked of his doubts, but he did not upon the whole expect a very cruel reception. It was his business, however, to say that he did, and he said it very prettily. What he might say on the subject a 12 month after must be referred to the imagination of husbands and wives. Sort of a cryptic paragraph and sort of just a little hint of um, Austin's, I don't know, I guess you could say her more acerbic side there. It's always struck me as, as odd. You get a sense that these marriages are, are, are good enough. They're yes. not, they're not, they're not world beating. They're not the best things imaginable, but they're good enough. Yes, 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 exactly. Now, the last line of the novel is about sisterhood. Mm-hmm. We talk about great Jane Austen opening lines and, and the Pride and Prejudice one, of course, is about, about marriage. This novel ends with a line not about marriage. The story ends with marriage, but the, lo- the last line is about sisterhood. And it's this, quote, among the merits and happiness of Eleanor and Marianne, let it not be ranked as the least considerable that those sisters and living almost within sight of each other, they could live without disagreement between themselves or producing coolness between their husbands, unquote. What is the meaning of that last line? Why is that the last line? Oh, it, and it's sort of um, as unsparkling as the first line, if you like, in, in its restraint. Uh, I think it go, but I think it goes right to the heart of the novel, which has a lot to do with the effort, the difficulty, the challenge of um, conforming ourselves to what society asks of us. We, you know, we come into the world, we have these raw thoughts, the raw feelings, our sincere responses, our emotions, and all the rest, and we have to somehow channel those into uh in, in in into propriety and mannered conduct and and the all the restraints and limits that go with various relationships in society and i think what austin is showing in that last line is it's not actually easy to just live in harmony and love and affection with with those around us even with your even with your sister even if with your closest family and relations, there's a kind of effort and a friction that's always going to be part of that. And to overcome that is a great accomplishment. And so if you look at it closely, it, um, it, you know, it doesn't read with a great deal of uh, dramatic flair. But actually, I think what it says is, is very incisive. There's a question I always ask you when we have conversations about, about Jane Austen for this podcast. And I'm going to ask it again because I think it's an important one. Is Sense and Sensibility a book for women, or can men also enjoy and learn from it? I think certainly men can enjoy from learn and learn from it, and uh, a couple of, couple of points to make there. It has a lot to say about the way that women read men's behavior and the way they sometimes misread men's behavior and the sort of assumptions they make about men's behavior. So there's a great deal of sort of... Um, uh, education here, I guess, if you like, for young men who are trying to understand women's responses to them. Um, Colonel Brandon uh, is always speaking from a woman's perspective and a woman who talks a lot with other women about Jane Austen. Colonel Brandon is usually ranked right up there with Mr. Darcy in terms of appealing Jane Austen heroes. So he's a great model if you're looking for a sort of a Mr. Darcy uh, alternative model in Jane Austen's canon. He's, He's a great character. This novel, Sense and Sensibility, has been adapted a number of times to the screen. There was a a version by the BBC a couple of times, also in Mm -hmm. 1995, a movie Mm -hmm. adapted by Emma Thompson, also starring her as Eleanor and Kate Winslet as Marianne, plus Hugh Grant and Alan Rickman. Have you seen these? Do you recommend them? I recommend them all. I have a special... Uh, affection for the Emma Thompson version, which is just perfectly cast, and Alwyn Rickman as Colonel Brandon is is just right on point. One of the advantages, I think, of seeing a film version is that both Colonel Brandon and Edward Farrar's are somewhat quiet, reserved characters, and especially Edward in the pages of the novel can seem a little flat, but on screen you get a sense of who he is. You get a sort of more rounded sense, I guess you could say, uh, of Edward, and I think that's a great virtue of seeing a film version, even if you're a fan of the book. Last question about 
Sense and Sensibility, you mentioned that it was the first published novel of hers. It was not the first one she wrote. Northanger Abbey, I guess, was the first one that, that, that she wrote. Where does Sense and Sensibility fit in the canon of, of Jane Austen? It's early in a sense. I mean, as her first published, it's also in a sense not as not as fully mature as some of her later work. And I, and I say that with hesitation because it is it is truly great in its own right. But the the opposition between the sisters is sometimes a little strained. Um, there are some passages that you feel uh, could be perhaps shortened a little bit and condensed. It's not quite as economical and. Um, sort of lean as as a work like Pride and Prejudice, uh, but it is um, incredibly thoughtful. I mean, it's the fruit, you, you get the sense it is the fruit of years of incredibly intense social observation, and it is, I would say, one of the most thoughtful of her novels, actually, in its commentary on the way we relate with one another in in society. So... I can't recommend it highly enough, but it has a sort of quiet charm in contrast to a work like Pride and Prejudice. Lorraine Murphy, we're out of time. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've just listened to The Great Books Podcast, a production of National Review and sponsored by Audible. Remember, start listening to Audible with a 30-day trial and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash great books or text great books to 500 500. Please subscribe to the great books podcast and leave reviews of that show that helps us keep this podcast going. Send me your ideas for future episodes on Twitter. My handle is at Hey Miller. Last of all, a special thanks to you for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of the great books podcast.